see it I literally was famous played out by a LinkedIn a discussion thread once when I lived in uh, Chief Stainville in uh, Gabriela Arian and Sato. Hi. And then uh, someone was, uh, was in a thread that was posted by when she's influential by her to say what the whole post to check it out. And then uh, you can see uh, Florian, she extended an overture to that cloud. And it said, no, thank you. Despite the fact she invited Yeah, and it just felt really not a good look. They were both my colleagues, so it's like not a good look here. That if you just outright rejected an opportunity to sit at the table. Yeah. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, this is just a short pre uh, announcement. I'd like to invite everyone who's standing to come and have a seat with us. Um, we want to encourage everyone to sort of get ready for the event to start. And the, there are some folks watching online. Um, if you're watching online, we apologize for a slight delay in uh, getting everyone down here in the room, and we'll be um, starting in just a few minutes so bear with us but please if you're if you're in the room come join us up front and let's let the people who are late arrivers uh, fill in the back um, and then we can um, we can make sure to um, get started not too much too late no thanks I'm not, I'm not, but keep an eye on that that's cool there's a lot of metrics on diets <laughs> Yeah. 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 Ye
All of you could take your seats, please. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, uh, and welcome to this uh, second speaker series event, which FAO and Eco Agriculture co host. So, uh, we are seeing the after effects of uh, a, a three day. A weekend, so I, I guess uh, no. <clears throat> okay, can you now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me welcome all of you to the second uh, in the speaker series events which FAO and Eco Agriculture is co-hosting, and uh, this is indeed very uh, timely uh, because uh, landscape approach is gathering momentum, and to keep this momentum going, uh, you'll always need. Uh, uh, adequate, timely, and sustainable investment uh, uh, to ensure for that to happen, uh, we need thought leaders who can uh, clearly articulate the economic, the social, and the environmental benefits uh, and the returns from investments in natural uh, uh, landscapes. Uh, we have a panel of distinguished speakers today who will help us understand issues around uh, the need for investment and the models uh, which are out there in the open. Uh, using the landscape approach to achieve uh, the goal of reducing hunger and poverty while ensuring a sustainable use of natural resources uh, is increasingly finding uh, resonance within uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of UN or the FAO, as we all know it. Uh, there's, a, there's a growing realization that the different land use components are activities within landscape are often interrelated. And the fact that most of the land use activities, whether it be production or whether it be forestry, livestock, fisheries, they all fall in the mandate of uh, FAO and the area of expertise of FAO makes the landscape approach a very natural fit for the organization. Uh, Along with this increasing resonance within uh, FAO to the landscape approach, there is also increased uh, realization that uh, landscape restoration will require significantly greater uh, uh, flow of financial resources if, if the global, regional, and national restoration targets are to be met. Uh, restoring 350 million hectares of degraded land by 2030, as was in the Bonn, uh, call at Bonn, uh, uh, goes uh, far beyond uh, the current levels of uh, investments that we see. And for investment to flow, we need to deepen the understanding around uh, natural capital and the services that ecosystem provides. Uh, it is crucial that the world understands the interrelationships between environmental quality and economic profitability, and that this information is then integrated into a macroeconomic analysis and included in decision-making processes. Uh, it's also very clear that it goes far beyond uh, the capacity of governments and the capacity of philanthropy to fill this uh, financing uh, uh, gap. And it, it requires private investments to come in. And for private sector investment to come in, it is necessary that we understand the challenges that inhibit their participation. We work to overcome those and we incentivize the private sector by presenting a business model to them. Uh, unless you do that, unless you present a business model, it will be extremely tough to get the private sector uh, to really uh, start financing or investing in this uh, arena. Uh, so what are we at FAO doing uh, about all this? Uh, so when I was uh, putting my thoughts on paper, uh, just one question came to me is that are we, are we really landscape ready at FAO? And, and my short answer is no, but we are getting there, and we are getting there, uh, taking huge strides. Uh, since 2015, a significant amount of FAO support to restoration has been provided by the Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism, which has included a, sustain, a sustainable financing of landscape restoration. So I'll just give you a brief peek into the activities that are happening there. Uh, publication of a discussion paper on sustainable financing for forest and landscape restoration along with a policymaker's guide and a key message infographic, study carried out in partnership with eco-agriculture, local financing mechanism for forest and landscape restoration, uh, creation of a new community of practice on local financing for forest and landscape restoration, 
with first uh, knowledge sharing forum and webinar planned later in this year. Uh, work on cost-benefit analysis of different types of uh, landscape restoration. This is, I think, is an extremely important area of work given the lack of data and information which exists all around. Uh, FAO has been collaborating closely with UNCCD Global Mechanism and establishment of the Land Degradation uh, Neutrality Fund. Uh, development of value chain related to landscape management and restoration and country level. The list goes on, but I think it's, it's, it's best if I stop here, because we do have from FAO, which we didn't know earlier, but today we came to know that we do have from FAO Christopher, Christopher Bessier, who leads FAO's FLR mechanism, and he was in DC for the meeting which starts at IFC tomorrow, so he's, he's agreed to be with us here today. So all uh, questions in and around FAO's work on this in and around uh, landscape approach, in and around financing. Uh, we will have him uh, join us for the Q&A at the end of the panel discussion. And so uh, I'll stop here and uh, give the floor to Sarah to take the proceedings forward, introduce our guests, and uh, get on with it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, all of you who are here in this community interested in landscapes in Washington, D.C., uh, the folks who have joined us here from the Global Landscapes Forum investment case meeting that's going to be happening tomorrow, uh, who we've been collaborating with the GLF also in the organization of this project, of this event, as well as with FAO. And I want to welcome all of the folks who are joining us through live streaming. It's very exciting to be able to have a larger audience for this really fascinating panel today. As I think you're aware, the title of our event today is Towards Sustainable Landscapes Investment Investing creative strategies to reorient capital for restoration and regeneration. As most of you know, for over a century, our public policies around agricultural natural resources and economic development have been organized in competing silos. And with growing population, growing economies, this siloed model is no longer working for us. Uh, there are just too many interlinkages and interdependencies between our food systems, biodiversity, water, climate, infrastructure, and, and our economies. So innovations are actually exploding all around the world in response to, this, to these challenges um, and the desire for transformation to a more sustainable economy. One of the most um, important and promising approaches is what we call integrated landscape management, or ILM. Let me just take a moment to define how we're going to be using these terms today. When we use the term landscape, we're referring to a place, a socio-ecological system with natural and human modified ecosystems, which is influenced by its own distinct history, economy, ecology, and, and, and cultural um, life. An example for those of you who live nearby would be the whole Chesapeake Bay watershed with its myriad fishing, farming, recreation, tourism, urban, water, industry, and cultural values for many different stakeholders. Integrated landscape management is the term we use of managing a landscape that involves collaboration among its multiple stakeholders with the purpose of achieving sustainable landscapes. These platforms may vary in terms of the governance structure, their size, their scope of action, the number and type of stakeholders that are involved. They vary in terms of the depth of cooperation, some of them being, being just simple information sharing and others having very complex governance systems uh, and more legalized models of decision making. Integrated landscape investments are designed to generate economic, environmental, and social benefits. Returns rely on landscape stakeholders and investors working in a synergistic way across the landscape. Their success often requires thoughtful sequencing and spatial coordination. They often blend or align government, donor, philanthropic funds seeking social and environmental returns with commercial capital that's seeking financial returns. Many of what we call enabling investments may be needed in order, in order to catalyze significant asset investments that actually make change in the landscape. My organization, Eco Agriculture Partners, has been working for 15 years to understand and promote these large scale, especially agricultural, uh, landscape initiatives. We've documented uh, more than 428 of these globally. 
uh, in 92 different communities of practice that have different entry points, different focus, different philosophy. Many billions of dollars are now being spent on integrated landscape investments by public, private, and civic actors. Um, the, what we're beginning to see is that integrated landscape management can lower risks, lower costs, provide co-financing opportunities, and higher returns than can standalone investments in some of these complex landscapes. However, most of the finance mechanisms and investment modes remain single sector and largely ill-suited to the multi-objective land use projects that are needed to achieve landscape-wide transformation. There are few mechanisms um, for investing large capital pools in the diverse small-scale deals that are needed for regeneration. And most landscape initiatives have pretty weak capacities to design and finance investable projects. One of the things I want to take advantage of, uh, some of you may have seen now that the uh, at, when you registered a uh, flyer here for the Landscape Investment and Finance Toolkit, which Eco Agriculture developed together with IUCN Netherlands as a tool to support landscape initiatives to develop <coughs> such kinds of investable deals with synergies. Our objective in convening today's event is to catalyze conversations among policymakers, financiers, and influencers here in Washington, D.C., and with the Global Landscapes Forum um, community around this landscape financing challenge. We'll be discussing some core questions like what is the state of investment in, landscape, uh, in sustainable landscapes? What are the biggest barriers to increased coordinated investment? What are the most effective financial innovations that are emerging? So to speak about these issues, I would like to invest our very distinguished panelists. Greatly appreciate joining us today. The first is Christiane Delval, who's the founder and managing partner of Althelia Ecosphere and Althelia Climate Fund, whose company has become one of the world's leading impact investors in sustainable land use. Then we will have Kari Cohen, who's the director of the conservation innovations team of the United States Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation Service, who leads the agency's environmental markets and conservation finance activities. Uh, and finally, we have Robert Parento, who's a principal at Macro Strategy Edge, who has spent 30 years at a, as an investment strategy for Wall Street institutional investors, and then shifted his focus to financial innovations for integrated landscape management. He's now collaborating with Eco Agriculture Partners in our new 1,000 Landscapes initiative that hopes to break open new financing for integrated landscape management. Each of the speakers will spend about eight or 10 minutes um, introducing their innovative finance work and the lessons that they've drawn from that. And uh, then we'll have a discussion among um, all, all of you. And uh, there's also an opportunity for those of you who are in the live streaming to, uh, to send us, I think, some written questions that you may have. And we'll make an effort to, uh, to, to include those as well. And I'll, I'll count on my colleagues in the back there to notify me when there are questions like that. Any questions before we begin? OK, let me start then with, uh, with you, Christy. Thank you, Sarah. Um, can everyone hear me OK? I'm not used to not having a microphone stuck in front of my nose. It's a, it's a magic I'm sure it's, uh, it's very loud. We um, can hear you, but we can't see you. Ah, well, it's, uh, that's definitely the best part. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Stand up if you'd like. Anybody who's comfortable standing up. OK. Um, so um, I thought when, uh, when you asked me to, to join the uh, panel, Sarah, I was, I was flattered and, and excited. And I'm glad it worked out that I could. But I, I thought back about those conversations we had, which were really good. Um, but upon reflection, I sort of thought, God, I, I must have sounded so cynical because <laughs> to you on the phone. And I think that you know, if you spend long enough in the coalface, particularly in you know, structuring investment cases um, for this, this, this space, you know, it's easy to become cynical. But, I, but I, 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 you know, when I put my head down on my pillow at night, I, I do let the positivity soak back in. So since I just came back from holiday, I'm going to try to start on a positive tip. But I apologize in advance if I get a little bit too you know, grizzled and grumpy. But I think it's important to, to, that we all remain, remain um, keep our eye on reality. Because at the end of the day, um, when um, people operating in the space um, of you know, sustainable landscapes, ILM, whatever we're calling it, there's a, a fantastic list uh, in, your, uh, in your paper, Sarah. Um, generally, people want to roll out someone to speak for the private sector. And there are about four or five of us, sadly, that get the call a lot. And, and whilst we're flattered, it is still a relatively lonely space. And why is that? 
I mean, um, after all, we know um, that the full value of nature of global uh, of full value of nature to global GDP is somewhere between 75 and 125 trillion. That's on par with global GDP itself. Um, and we know how much uh, from recent studies, but they come out every year, every month of every year, how much of our GDP is at risk if we fail to meet to make our one and a half degree uh, targets or even our two degree targets. And the difference between two degrees and three degrees is enormous. So it's, it's striking that we have such a small group of actors you know, in the room when we're talking about the business case for making investments into integrated landscape management. Nevertheless, we're delighted and proud and happy to be one of those actors in the room. So maybe if I just tell um, uh, the, the room a little bit about Althelia, for those of you who, who don't know about us, uh, we were set up um, back in 2011, uh, myself and another gentleman by the name of Sylvain Goupy, uh, coming out of uh, BNP Paribas Investment Banking. We set um, Althelia up really as a new type of impact investment platform that would focus really on the, on the nexus, I like to call it, between on the one hand protection and conservation, and on the other hand sustainable production systems. Now we didn't hatch that egg on day one. Um, we actually, back in the, the formative days of our business model, 2009, 10, and 11, still believed in the power and the, and the aspiration of uh, the global community writ large to launch, um, if you will, a, a UNFCCC-led system that was going to... Sorry. Acronym? Ah, sorry. Uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Yeah, I'll only say that once. Um, um, because it only merits being said once, because frankly, not a single tree has been, you know, um, has, 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 has remained standing due to the UNFCCC framework, and I, and I say that with love. Um, nevertheless, in, in those heady days, we believed that a, um, a system sort of Kyoto Protocol-esque or EU ETS-esque, e -E ETS European Emissions Trading System-esque, could pave the way for creating an incentive-based approach to generating sustainable outcomes in the forest space. But as we know, uh, it didn't happen. That's why we're all sat here and still talking about this. So having um, convinced uh, our employers, BNP Paribas, um, and a number of other sort of investors who were willing to put their, um, their necks out uh, in, in what was still a very formative space, that this was good business, um, we needed to make it so. So that's where we sort of came around to, to looking at sustainable production systems, sat in a parallel um, sort of um, uh, configuration with um, conservation-led systems that could be funded by PES and, and Red Plus, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't just um, the, the necessity of the lack of the international will to deliver an incentive-based program under the Red Plus uh, mantra that led us there. It was also a realization that people don't get out of bed looking at a forest next to them and say, ah, well, that's where I keep my carbon, and I'll just wait for my carbon payments to come through the post today. No, I mean, you know, we, we know that the expansion of the agricultural frontier and, and, and sort of... Um, 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 kind of balkanized mosaic type deforestation is all is all generally led by economic or, or motivated by economic means, and it's the human will to an aspiration to improve the lot that is is kind of driving it. So we felt like we needed to come up with an investment model that was relevant to the actors on the ground who were involved in conversion of land, degradation of land, um, and 99% of them aren't doing it out of sinister motivation. They're doing it because they 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 need to make you know ends meet. So that's where we sort of came back to, to focusing on how do we improve productivity, how do we improve quality of agricultural production, particularly in the <coughs> global south where soils and inputs can be quite lacking. Um, how, do we, um, how do we improve uh, social situations on the ground, security of land tenure and so forth as part of an investment model that will then on the back end generate certainly economic improvement for the, the people that we're dealing with, that have, have business relationships with, will generate financial returns for investors, but also meaningful and quantifiable social impact, impacts around biodiversity conservation, and of course, very importantly, impacts quantifiable and robust emission reduction um, um, uh, units, um, or at least a, 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 a viable carbon accounting framework. I've got one minute left. So that was um, com coming out of the Althelia, um, uh, coming out of that journey. That was the Althelia business model. Maybe in the Q and A, I can get into talking a little bit about um, how one or two of our investments work. 
Um, but I will say that um, the, the, the last kind of opening comment I'll make is when we attended the session uh, that the GLF held in London, which was meant to be the precursor to tomorrow's session, it was all about how do we build the, um, the talking points around um, the business case for investing in sustainable landscapes. And, and there was a lot of, um, I suppose, momentum at the top and amongst the organizers to talk about launching a new asset class. And I, as well as another, uh, other sort of um, uh, participants, really pushed back against this because the fact of the matter is um, natural capital is not a new asset class. It's a very old asset class, and perhaps it's the oldest asset class in the world. I mean, it's been the efforts to convert natural capital into financial capital that have gotten us to this point where we are today. And, you know, the, the hundreds of billions that's invested into timber, into agriculture across the developed and developing world, that's done so without a sustainability lens. Sustainability lens. So all we're trying to do is to improve an existing asset class so that it can continue to produce human benefit for our generation as we grow older, but also for generations in the future. It's not a new asset class, it's the oldest asset class, but we've been doing it wrong for the last thousand years. It's time to get it right. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, with, without any uh, delay, let me go ahead and ask Kari to give us a perspective from the U.S. Sure. situation. Great, thank you. Again, my name is Kari Cohen. I work at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, great to be here today. We always love to uh, to talk to new audiences and uh, you know get our message out to new faces and it's great to be a faceless bureaucrat and between these two sophisticated um, uh, financial gurus. Um, so please raise your hand real quick if you've heard of NRCS before. Oh that's good. Um, I'll just speak very quickly. My mother uh, still thinks I work for NRGC but, uh, uh, you know, NRCS is at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We were born out of the Dust Bowl. Uh, an NRCS employee cannot speak in public without mentioning the Dust Bowl or we get docked uh, a week's pay. Um, but, you know, uh, once uh, we solved the problem of soil erosion, uh, over time, our mission broadened um, uh, to the point where we are today which is a, uh, an agency that has a budget about uh, $4 billion per year, uh, a, a force, a ground force of about 10,000 to 11,000, depending on the week in the administration, of folks out in the countryside. And those folks are out there on farms, on ranches, on forest lands, working one-on-one -on -one, uh, with agricultural producers and land managers uh, to address their natural resource challenges. And for a long time, um, we kind of worked with whomever walked in the door, and that was both for cultural reasons within the agency, and also probably for political reasons. You know, uh, there's a lot of congressmen and women who have uh, uh, farmers and ranchers as constituents, and you know, they certainly enjoyed seeing that uh, our funding be spread around. Um, but as our knowledge, our collective knowledge, I should say, um, of um, an understanding of the impacts of farming and ranching on the environment as we got as we got a more sophisticated understanding i think we collectively got a better understanding that where we put conservation on the ground um, uh, can really impact uh, you know how well our funding and our resources perform and so uh, beginning in about 2008 uh, we started dedicating a substantial amount of funding to what we call called our landscape initiatives uh, these were things that spanned our natural resource concerns. So we had a sage grouse initiative and a lesser prairie chicken initiative. We had a longleaf pine initiative in the southeast. Uh, had these big water quality initiatives, including the Chesapeake Bay and the Great Lakes. And uh, within those initiatives, we started really looking to target our funding to those places and those soil types and the topography and the placement in the watershed where we felt like um, putting our resources would give us the biggest bang for the buck. And I know that uh, our chief, Leonard Jordan, was here last year and talked about some of the successes that we've had with those initiatives, including uh, the work uh, that we did with the sage grouse initiative that you know, helped uh, lead to an avoided listing of sage grouse on the endangered, spe uh, endangered species list. Um, we've had some, uh, contributed to some deed listings of streams uh, from the 303D uh, uh, list um, under our National Water Quality Initiative. We've certainly done a a whole heck of a lot of work. Uh, Sarah mentioned the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We've done a tremendous amount of work alongside our state partners and nonprofit partners and others. Uh, and I think we're starting to see some benefits from that work as the Chesapeake 
uh, bay, both in water quality and in underwater grasses and in um, uh, fisheries, uh, is slowly starting to recover. But what I wanted to talk a little bit about today uh, in my remaining time is the work that I'm focused on, me and my team. And uh, that is really the notion that um, no matter how much money NRCS has, and you know, we're a $4 billion agency right now, a year, uh, you know, it's been pretty constant over the past decade. Uh, that's never going to be enough to really solve the natural resource challenges that we see on a landscape scale or even national scale uh, that result from private lands. So at USDA, we estimate that we probably touch about 15 to 20 percent of landowners uh, out there or land managers. Um, and so really what happens to the other 80 percent, right? You're never going to solve those big landscape scale problems just touching 20 percent of folks. And so, uh, you know, uh, my other panelists here and Sarah mentioned, you know, there's a real drive to find other funding sources that can grow the pie um, to, you know, bring more funding. And in our case, we're really more interested in bringing more funding to private lands conservation. Um, and so we work on environmental markets, we work on conservation finance um, approaches, and it's really kind of new work for us. We really started this in about 2015. And why is NRCS in this ball game? And there's really just a handful of us at NRCS that are doing this. Almost everybody else is dedicated to the hard work that it takes to uh, get that three billion to four billion dollars into the hands of our, our uh, producers out there. So why uh, are there a handful of us, you know, doing this kind of more innovative emerging issues work? One, we do think it can extend our mission. Like I said, we can't touch everybody, and we need to find other sources of uh, funding. And also, we feel like we have uh, some scientific understanding and also some tools that can help folks uh, like my uh, fellow panelists here and other project managers, other folks that are out there trying to find financial vehicles um, in the sustainable ag or ag conservation space um, that can help them understand the impact of conservation on the landscape. Uh, we have some financial uh, resources available. We have 34 conservation finance pilot projects uh, that are currently underway in Maybe in the Q&A uh, session, um, I can you know, describe what some of those are. But I think we're really starting to see a kind of a thousand flowers bloom in this private lands conservation finance arena. Um, just a couple weeks ago, um, I wrote this down so I wouldn't mess it up. The Conference of Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers issued an RFP looking for someone to manage and, and raise a $250 million blue growth fund that's really trying to uh, address water quality, both in a uh, you know, wastewater and utility sense, but also in a, in a private lands and agriculture sense. And so people are talking about real money in, in substantial landscapes. There's been uh, investors conferences within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, there's work going on in the Gulf of Mexico uh, watershed, uh, looking at how do they leverage deep water horizon uh, uh, damage funding. And so, you know, we see just a, a whole lot of activity in this space and happy to get into it um, in, in, in the Q&A session. That's great. Thank you, Kari, for that introduction. Um, let, me, let me move the conversation over to Rob Parento, who's been looking at sort of what are some of the innovative approaches that are on the horizon. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me to speak. Thank each of you for taking some time out of your day to be with us. And most importantly, thank you for the people that are working in this area. I think more and more people are beginning to understand if we have economic systems and financial systems that consistently erode ecosystem services, we won't have economies and financial systems. And I suspect a lot of the clues that we're going to find to reorient our economy along more regenerative lines are going to come out of these integrated landscape management experiments. So I think this is very valuable work, and I, I value each of you that are doing it. I want to talk about two challenges that I think are recurring themes when you talk with people that are working in this area and some possible solutions. The first one is the size impediment. If we're going to talk about bringing large flows of finance, institutional money, pension fund money, um, sovereign wealth fund money into financing this area, we have to be thinking bigger. We have to be able to deliver larger projects. Now, why is this the case? When you look at what an institutional investor like Alphelia has to go through in order to make a decision about committing funds to particular projects, there's a number of very expensive and, and time-involved um, um, steps that have to go on. 
you have to do what's called due diligence as an investor. You have a fiduciary, usually you have a fiduciary responsibility to the people whose money that you're managing. And that means you're gonna go out and look at all the assumptions, kick the tires, meet the people behind the project to make sure not only is it real, in other words, there's not fraud going on, but in fact, um, these are feasible projects. There's a good chance that they will be successful and you need to get very familiar with all the risks around the project. What could make this thing fail and be sure there's ways of mitigating that risk or at least you're willing to accept that risk given the returns that you think will be available from that project, whether they're financial returns or um, ecological or social returns. So due diligence is one of the more time intensive and costly parts. You won't be likely to do that work if it's only a million dollar deal, but if it's a $10 million deal, you might be more willing to take that time, make that expense. There's a transaction cost in each of these deals. They just don't magically fall out of the sky. There's a lot of negotiation that has to go on. There's a lot of lawyers that have to be paid to make these things happen. And so again, these are things that tend to lead to uh, the need for higher um, size deals. And then there's a monitoring cost. After you've made the investment, you still have to go out and hopefully they're reporting quarterly or semi-annually or annually to you in terms of their ability to achieve the milestones, the outcomes that they're promising. And again, someone has to be familiar enough with the project to ask the right questions, to know whether um, the outcomes are matching the expectations along the way. And often, uh, there's a requirement of being able to think, um, to fly by the seat of your pants. Things come up that you never anticipated. And often you have to be like a armchair quarterback to a lot of these projects along the way. It can be a very hands-on intensive thing where you're bringing your contacts to the table to help them solve different problems that they didn't even anticipate they were gonna run into. So these three things uh, are Im impediments at the current, um, that contribute to the impediment of size currently. So what are some possible solutions? Well, uh, I'm gonna discuss three of them. I think in general though, when we're talking about integrated landscape management, we need to also be thinking about integrated finance. And the simplest way to think about this is the sequencing of investments has to be appropriate for the ecosystems that we're dealing with in these landscapes. So if you want to design interventions to deal with coastal issues, you probably need to be thinking about interventions in the agricultural systems upstream from that. If you want to get the interventions right in the agricultural uh, area, you need to be thinking about interventions to do first in the watershed. And then to get the watershed interventions correct, you probably need to do the forest interventions first. So there's a sequencing issue that needs to be addressed in, in this integrated finance that needs to go along with the ILM. There's also a complementarity, apart from the engineering or ecosystem uh, element to it, uh, we need to think about how these different interventions may be synergistic. If we get the right interventions on the, on the forest, we may improve the return prospects or reduce the risk prospects in financial terms for the things downstream from there. So it may make it uh, more attractive for investors to get into watershed investments if we get the forest investments right. So there's a complementary piece to this. And then in terms of integrated, we also need to talk about aggregation. How do we aggregate up these different possible interventions and projects inside one landscape? So I'm gonna talk about those uh, very briefly. The first one is an instrument that we could use. And again, these are prospective um, solutions here. The, an instrument that we could use uh, that borrows from Wall Street's use of asset-backed securities. And you can think of this as the difference between making wine from grapes from one vineyard or making wine from grapes from many vineyard. Let's say you've got a variety of biodigester projects as you've identified within the landscape. There's a lot of agricultural waste being generated by palm oil plants or something like that. And each one is about a million dollar investment. You're gonna have a hard time attracting big money to that million dollar investment. But you could potentially pool all those million dollar, one million dollar loans to say 10 biodigesters in one region and aggregate them into an asset backed security. Essentially if you had, and this is very simplified, one bank making one million dollar loans to each of those uh, biodigester plants, you could um, get those biodigester plants to pay into a special purpose vehicle is what they call it. So they're making their quarterly payments into that special purpose vehicle. And then that special purpose vehicle can take that money out, money and pay it out in any form or fashion it wishes to investors. So usually the way they do this is they have a higher risk segment 
and a lower risk segment. So you might find uh, people that are more interested in the eco uh, economic, social, ecological benefits in a lower risk tranche. And you might find the more risk preferring investors like hedge funds and so forth getting interested in the, the higher risk tranche of these asset backed securities. So here's one way to roll up all these investments into a size using this one instrument that could be more available to the pension funds, university endowments, and so forth. So that's one approach. A second approach, uh, how many of you have IRA, IRAs and 401ks? Good. Uh, you might make it through retirement then. And <laughs> how many of you use mutual funds inside those IRAs? And, and yeah. So most of us have some familiarity with this. Uh, a way to think about aggregating up investments in a landscape is to create something similar to a mutual fund. If you have a balanced fund or a multi-asset fund in your portfolio, this would help make more sense of it. And what we're talking about here is there'll be a variety of different kinds of instruments used inside a landscape. Some of them will be leases, some of them be, may be loans, some of them may be long-term purchasing agreements like the power purchasing agreements, some of them may be green bonds or other types of debt. Uh, some of them may be equity positions. And what you're looking for is a diversification, not only across different kinds of projects like uh, composting facilities, agroecology uh, projects, and biodigestion projects getting financed, but across all these different kinds of instruments that will have different return and risk profiles and also different correlations in their returns over time. So one of the fundamental tenets of modern portfolio theory is you want a diversified portfolio. You want to diversify the risk across the portfolio. So creating these landscape funds would allow us to aggregate up to a size where, again, institutional investors could be plugged in, along with dealing some of the risk mitigation uh, issues that often come up with um, financing within these landscape management uh, functions. So Eco Enterprises Fund is an example of this. It's not doing it inside one landscape, which is what we're proposing, but they have sustainable agriculture sustainable aquaculture, agroforestry, and ecotourism investments all wrapped up into this one fund, which institutional investors can uh, get involved with. If you wanted to take this to the next level, if we had several of these landscapes with landscape funds involved, we could go to what the hedge funds refer to as fund of funds. So you could get geographical um, diversification by having, say, a landscape in Africa, a landscape in Latin America, a landscape in Eastern Europe, Wrapping those all up into one larger mutual fund, the hedge fund world is very familiar with how to do this, um, and it would take away some of the currency risk issues, the political risk issues that can come up when you're dealing with a landscape only in one country or in one region. The third uh, approach to dealing with this size matters issue uh, could be bioregional development corporations or bioregional development authorities. Uh, this would extend the jurisdictional approach that we see being developed in ILM. And it could also have some attributes of holding companies that we see people like Warren Buffett creating uh, along the way here. This would be a way of combining the public-private partnership models with the multi-stakeholder platform uh, models. They would have a co-management um, role there. This could potentially be an entity that issued its own debt along with organizing the blended finance that we know we're getting more and more familiar with in the impact investing world. So they would coordinate the blending of these financial packages. Uh, they might also be critical in developing or identifying the technical assistance, which is so needed for many of these projects. And they could be uh, also central in deploying the funds that are raised to the different projects, which is a, a, a technical form managerially. This also would give a point person or a point organization to uh, take care of the issue of investor confidence. An investor wants to be able to pick up the phone and talk with someone on the other end that can tell them what's going on. And uh, by having one authority responsible for all of the landscape development, you would at least know that you've got a, a line of accountability there that you could tap if things start to go uh, sideways on you. There's an example of this in Kenya, the Laikipa County Development Authority. There's different budding um, entities that are showing these types of attributes. Again, these are initial proposals. I wouldn't pretend to have these all worked out. Um, so that's the first, uh, the size impediment issue is the first big problem that you often run into when you're looking at, the, at these issues. The second one is investment readiness. We're sort of trying to run before we learn how to walk when we talk about the aggregation issue. Um, we have really good protocols 
for multi-stakeholder platforms to develop their vision. Uh, they can take the form of landscape action plans, which defined outcomes that they're looking at. But this is not the same thing as having a business plan in hand or a project plan in hand that will be enticing to an investor. Investors are used to pretty um, high uh, detail descriptions of what the prospective cash flows are, what the costs are going to be, what kind of expertise is going to be needed, what kind of technologies are involved. And this is often hard for a multi-stakeholder -stak platform to generate on their own. So it's sort of a professionalization of the project planning, of the business planning needs to go on inside these landscapes. We do have some, uh, again, initial solutions showing up in this area. Eco Agriculture Partners has the lift tool that they're providing, which is a step in this direction. Uh, CPIC has a variety of blueprints that they're starting to create for different kinds of projects that could be integral in, in, uh, in any of these landscapes. Um, there's also the issue, the issue of governance, of accountability, which I mentioned uh, with the development corporation, um, and execution. When you've got a multi-stakeholder platform, there's a lot of different people involved. It's messy. There's negotiation. It's a very human process. Um, and so someone's got to be able to step up and play the role of the entrepreneur or the project leader. And uh, this is an issue that comes in uh, to play when investors are trying to get confidence about the, the prospects of a, of a project. Uh, all of this takes money. Uh, people are beginning to think about how to design seed funds in order to provide this kind of assistance so you get to this point of investment readiness. Uh, there's communities of practice being formed, as we heard earlier as well, that allow different experts to coordinate or different people on the ground to share their experiences so we can learn from each other and get to some protocols and best practices as quickly as we can. So again, these are preliminary ideas about how to deal with two of the big challenges that we find uh, on the integrated landscape management front, the size impediment and the investment readiness. Uh, and I welcome your ideas and your efforts to develop these even further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I'd like to ask a couple of follow-up questions of you all before we bring the rest of the group in. Um, Christian, can you, uh, there were two things that I wanted to ask you. The first one, for those who are not uh, familiar with Althelia, can you just very briefly tell us the size of the fund, the size of the typical deals that you, that you deal with, and about how many of them you all are managing now? First, and then I have a follow-up. I follow can, up. and I'm sorry, I meant to do that, and no, I got carried okay. away. Um, <laughs> ten minutes goes fast. So um, we have about 11 investments. Um, which, um, to which we've committed 100 million euros, 101 million euros to be precise. Um, I mentioned that we were operating at the nexus between uh, sustainable production and protection or conservation. And to put some numbers behind that, we have collectively across the portfolio just about 2.1 million hectares under improved protection. And that's combined and working in synergy with just under 40,000 hectares um, of land under sustainable production. And in most cases, that is going to be, um, for instance, uh, my, my favorite case study that I'm using right now here in DC is uh, our investment at Tambapata, which is a Madre de Dios, Peru. We've invested to roll out um, just about uh, 2,000 hectares of cocoa-based sustainable agroforestry systems, which are certified to being organic and fair trade, in the buffer zone of two national parks. And by doing that, you can really make the red programs, which are up and running uh, under a voluntary um, a, a red domain, um, maximize their um, effectiveness. Um, and it's not just because of the payments. It's because, well, you were talking about it, so, and it's in your very good paper that you provided us in advance to the panel. When you have these off-farm healthy ecosystems, be they watersheds, uh, rivers, um, forests, etc. It helps you when you're trying to achieve those productivity and improvements. So we didn't combine the protection with the production by accident. We did it because it makes good business sense. Why, if it's such a good idea, why weren't other funders coming in to fund it? What made it hard? What makes it hard for investors to do the kind of deal you did in Peru? Well, again, you, you said it in your short paper, um, the, the, the four or five pager, where you really introduced the concept of ILM, which I'm so annoyed that I haven't had that in my pocket for the last five years, because, I mean, I was reading it, and I'm just making tick marks all over it, because I'm like, yep, yep, yep. Um, so I agreed with just about every word of it. Um, you know, with the sort of the rise of neoliberal capitalism, and sorry for politically loaded terms, but that's what it is, um, 
you focus your investment on the farm. So if you want to grow food, you invest in the farm. And, and by definition, you ignore the surrounding landscape areas. And I'm afraid we're still dealing with a legacy of, uh, and very much a, a healthy legacy of that mindset. So investors who want to invest in agriculture are used to going to a TMO, so for forestry, a TMO, a timber fund, and they invest in a plantation of eucalyptus in Chile or in, in California or wherever, and that's it. They're not going to understand. Um, because the, 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 what Harvard MBAs teach is that you know this is this is good business. Invest in the farm. So you're just fighting a lot of perceptions and so forth. Um, uh, and I think it's also the, the the key. Maybe the answer to your question is um, the variable is time. So over a x an x year period of time, of course, all of these things that we all know um, about it being good financial sense to take the, 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 the view of healthier landscapes, et cetera. All that does manifest, and it can be uh, you know, um, recognized over time. But we live in a world of quarterly returns. And even the pension funds, who, who you, know, you would think of anybody in the world who's going to be patient and then be interested in patient capital and long-term um, performance would be them, because they've got to perform for the, the people in 35 years. Um, they're still interested in quarterly returns. So we, I think that we're going to have limited, uh, up, uh, limited um, um, success if we apply all of our work to making this asset class recognizable and, and investable by mainstream institutional investors. Yes, we have to do that, but we also have to do the harder job, perhaps, of making them understand what it is the hell we're talking about. Because you can, you, it's going to have to be a meeting. And that can be done by policy um, to a large extent. We're seeing a lot of positive stuff right now with ocean plastics. And we need that desperately. We, if we don't get the policy signals, um, then, then we're not going to be able to do it on our own. Equally, the transparency and technologies of blockchain and so forth can allow consumers to, who are more and more getting interested in traceability and transparency and understanding what that supply chain looks like. We need to work really hard to, to, to advance that dialogue too, because where policymakers fail, consumers can pick up the slack. Thank you very much. Um, Kari, let me uh, ask you to give us an example of one of these places that you've been working, one of these landscape programs where it really made a shift in terms of attracting new private sector investment, other, other forms of, of, of investment to the landscape challenge in this place. Can you give us an example of how it worked and who, what kind of actors were involved in it and why you think it was successful? Uh, I don't think there's a really good example yet okay. in the US. You know, I think this, um, this conservation finance area in uh, private lands conservation is still uh, quite burgeoning. Um, like I mentioned, we have a number of uh, kind of pilot projects uh, to try to develop these financial vehicles to a place where people like Althelia are, you know, are able to do due diligence and figure out that something is an investable proposition and something that uh, will work at scale um, so that you're not doing these small one-off deals or uh, bespoke kind of transactions. Um, all of that takes a good deal of time. A lot of those kind of ideas will fall by the wayside. You know, we've seen some success already. Uh, you know, we made an um, investment in the Oregon Climate Trust, which is this quasi-state uh, entity out in Oregon, um, where they developed this carbon fund, you know, all based on the notion that, uh, you know, you can sell forestry uh, carbon credits um, in the California regulated air market, um, greenhouse gas market. Uh, we provided them with some funding to develop this fund. Uh, they were able to raise uh, philanthropic funding from the Packard Foundation, and they recently fully invested their $5 million in, um, in carbon projects on, on private lands. And so there's a grasslands project, there's a digester project, there's a forestry project, and they are now going to turn around and try to raise $100 million to do similar things. And so that's really the concept behind what we're doing. Uh, trying to, again, develop these, these ideas that people have, and there's a lot of them now, about how can we uh, figure out a way to bring private capital to investable deals in sustainable agriculture or private lands conservation. I think that it's an, it's an area that um, a lot of people hadn't looked at for a long time, and so you know, we feel like there's a lot uh, of innovation still to come. Uh, whether you're looking at irrigation efficiency and how can we pay for those things and do those things actually pay off for producers, 
uh, nutrient management, um, transition to organic, all sorts of, of areas where we feel like there are investable propositions that really just need to be worked out in detail and uh, figured out how we can scale them up. Just one follow-up question. Yeah. Who are the kinds of entities that you work with in a place like the Oregon Trust? Who, who bring in financial expertise? Are these volunteers doing pro bono work for you, or is it people that figure out, the, are they in quasi-governmental organizations and have a... Where, where's the financial expertise coming? Who's working with the people in all these different uh, that's a great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, there's a growing number of uh, firms that are interested in conservation finance, actually investment firms. So we worked with people like Farmland LP, uh, Dirt Capital. These are uh, firms that are actually raising vast amounts of institutional capital uh, in service of, you know, doing uh, or investing in sustainable agriculture. Um, there's this real, uh, really where the gap exists as far as we can tell is between the, 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 the institutional finance um, and investable projects, right? When you are talking about private lands conservation, you're talking about working on uh, field by field, farm, farm by farm, ranch by ranch, and um, as Rob was saying, the transaction costs can be really substantial. Um, and so, you know, that is one of the real barriers, another of the real barriers that we see, and that takes real expertise, right? The financial piece is really important, but also how to translate the financial piece into on-the-ground conservation in a way that provides returns to investors um, is a really unique skill and something I think that, that we need to see uh, a lot more of. Thanks. So, so Rob, you spent all those years on Wall Street. And now you're learning and innovating around all of this landscape work. If we as a community want to communicate with these, the Wall Street folks, and obviously some of them aren't going to care, but for the ones who care, are there a few key things you think we need to be able to provide for them? How yeah. can we be most influential with so them? It is a separate world, and learning how to talk to Wall Street, um, even getting their attention itself is, is tricky. There's a whole... Uh, layer of financial literacy. Um, if you think about it, you don't really learn about finance unless you go get an MBA in finance or you have a rich uncle that teaches you how all these things work. But um, you know the, the, the language of finance you need to get familiar with, the different instruments you need to get familiar with. And a lot of the conservation groups, they're just beginning to step down this, this um, learning curve. So um, I don't think there are mechanisms yet to really build that financial literacy. I know individual organizations are taking some steps in that direction, but that's, that's missing not only um, at the convener level, but also at the landscape level. How do we talk to these multi-stakeholder platforms in a way that they can begin to grasp some of the financial um, principles and the, and the financial mechanisms that they might be able to use? Um, most of them are used to pretty um, elementary financial systems. Like there's a loan shark in town, and they charge you 40% on, on their loans, and that's all that they've known. Or there's um, circles of families that may have a lending pool, and you can draw from that every so often. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, learning the language of how do you project cash flows, doing pro forma income statements and balance sheets, what's actually on a balance sheet. Um, you have to start with some elementary accounting understanding that's the language of finance um, and getting familiar with what different kinds of financiers are looking for. A commercial bank will look for something different than uh, an institutional investor. So getting familiar with what you could call their intake process. What do they need to see before they're even willing to talk to you? And again, that getting that foot in the door is often the hardest thing. So if you don't have a really high quality project, you're not going to get the call back. Um, so I think those are some of the items that you want to pay attention to. Thank you very much. I have lots of other questions, but I want to uh, stop my own endless interest in this topic and uh, see what the people here in the room have to say, questions or comments. Yes, let, let, me, um, let, let me actually start with Christoph. If you'll just tell us uh, very briefly your experience with forest landscape restoration and come, come back. Uh, 
Maybe the okay, as we do it, if there's any other questions, he's been involved in this initiative. So I'm seeing you, sir. Uh, please, if you could identify your, your name and the organization you're with before you give your question. And remember that we need to have you with the microphone so that the folks on the live stream can hear. Thank you. It's uh, Yang Baidu, uh, Sustainable Development Investment Finance Partnership for New York. Uh, so overall, um, this was a point that was brought up uh, earlier this spring at uh, the Qing meeting at the Rock Foundation in New York. And one of the biggest uh, challenges is uh, the level of awareness amongst the institutional investors and what types of products are available, the range, and then how accessible they are at the retail investor level. So uh, what do you see could really be the lowest uh, hanging from that front is that just getting those products, those financial products that all of you described, much more accessible to the retail investor. Thanks. Um like to respond to that question. You want to say something, Just very quickly, and, yeah. and I think the, I'm going to tie it into the last point you made about um, about the suitability of, effectively, you're talking about the suitability of financial products um, to do the job we're asking them to do. So I think the mirror image of that is that it's very, there are, there's a dearth of financial products sitting out there for an institutional investor to get to put his money to work with that exposure should he should he wish you know and then of course awareness is a whole other level so I mean, we found this i mean our our experience in operating in the field and trying to deploy capital in the space is that the existing suite of financial products available to practitioners in the landscape is absolutely ill fit for purpose and um, i would say without exception every in institutional investor who came into our fund uh, and they are private and public, so people like BNP Paribas, AXA investment managers, et cetera, on the private side, but also on the public side, uh, FMO, the, the, the Dutch Development uh, Agency. None of them had an awareness or a, a recognition of this as, a, as an asset class. Again, my earlier comment, I said it's not a new asset class. They, they understood how to do it the old-fashioned way, but they didn't understand how to un look at the relationship between risk and return and that where, where the return was going to come from when you inserted that sustainability lens. So we've had to de develop our portfolio in a vacuum, basically. And, and all of the landscape activities that we're doing, I'm not saying that in a disparaging way, but we are operating in a landscape, I think. But we've had to effectively build, put, it's like Lego bricks. We've had to come with our own Lego set and build that. It wasn't there. And, and your question is a good one um, because it... You know, the answer to it is something we need to all coalesce around if we're going to move to the next level. Because I've always, often said if Alphelia does really well and generates 10 or 12 percent or whatever it might do, you know, for its investors, happy days. That's a wonderful story. But if we don't have other people following in our bow wake or we are not able to go out and replicate that, then it was an anecdote. So, yeah, I, I'm with you and hoping to find the, the, the answer to that very soon. Bob, did you want to add anything to that? What, was part of your question about how to get retail investors involved in this space? Yeah, so make yeah. things very accessible. Right. Retail investors. Let's say you have right. a 401k or mutual fund, and you just want some exposure right. to this new integrated land management asset class. So I, w I would suggest there's the beginnings of a model. Many more people are involved with ESG mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, acronym. Uh, <laughs> ecological, social, and governance related funds. So there's a criteria along with traditional financial return and risk that come into determining what investments are in those funds. And an ETF is an exchange traded fund. It's like a mutual fund except you can trade it at any point in the day. Mutual fund you can only trade at the end of the day. That's very simplistic. Um, so we've got a couple things going on. ESGs for um, ESG related mutual funds for the retail investor. We have this whole field of impact investing opening up for more institutional investors. Yeah, is included for pensions, I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. And there are some firms that's still very early on trying to figure out ways to tap into the retail investment uh, area. It's like not retired investments, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And, and Did you get that? So it's what still economically targeted investments. Economically targeted and investments. And for a pension fund, you have two different alternatives. Okay. Same return. You are permitted to go with the one that has additional benefits in addition to the financial. Okay, benefits. thank you very much. So All right, I should just say yeah. that what, what just talk, because maybe it's interesting to you. We can talk later. But one of the things we are working on for two thousand. Please, please use the mic. Oh, I thought I was. Sorry. Um, one of the things that we are working on for two thousand eighteen and nineteen is 
for lack of a better word, an aggregator structure that would pave the way for larger institutionals to come in because Robert was absolutely right. You know, if, if, it, if it's too fine a scale, even if the business model looks great, it's not going to work. So that's something we're working on now. Yeah, too granular. That's been the most absolutely. common feedback I got yeah. from the big pension funds and others. Yeah. Yeah. So feeders and aggregators is something we think the market needs, and it's it's we're we're, we're on the development side of that at the moment. Okay. Great. Had lots more hands up there. Let me see who's there. Uh, go ahead. Can you give her the yes? My name is Jerry Hush. I'm a consultant to the UN, UN system, and I've been working on issues of integration in a variety of sectors, not only in agroecology. Actually, I'm quite new to this one. I've been mostly in global public health issues and uh, climate change adaptation, which are all intimately connected. And I'm sitting here listening, <laughs> but I must admit, I think one of the key issues that I'm hearing is almost why isn't there more of a a tipping point. Why, is it, why isn't there increased engagement by populations around the world around these issues? And I think one of the fundamental things that has to be looked at is that you're actually discussing a paradox. People are caught right now. And I think the financing discussion is one of the ways that people are seeking to build a bridge so that there is increased activity around developing programs and policies that actually engage people all the way from the ground up. And I think it's quite important, one of the comments you said about um, free market liberal economic models as we're across the street from IMF. We did not arrive at the current agricultural models in a vacuum. They historically changed human beings' relationship to the land. It's almost as if we're rediscovering that we have to have a far more beneficial and regenerative relationship to the land if we are to survive both as a species and on the planet. And I'm curious about that upper level perception that you have. I don't want it to slide away that it's a neoliberal financial model that we're trying to fit our feet into. It may be that we need to completely redefine the way invest, the way monies flow. Maybe it is not private investment, which is focused on literally private land, which is a whole other relationship to land. So I'd like to get sort of an upper level, a next step um, re review from you as, as experts in this field. Thank you. We'd like to I'll just say quickly from a domestic standpoint, one of the things that I'm most excited about is um, not necessarily, you know, I'm certainly excited about the, the notion that we can, you know, raise more private capital or attract more private capital and institutional investment into private lands conservation. But I'm also interested in the, uh, the possibility of using existing financial institutions um, for the good of conservation. And so there's lots of people thinking about things right now, like the state of Iowa, and soon the state of Minnesota as well, um, are piloting these uh, ideas of um, providing uh, discounts on crop insurance premiums for farmers that are doing good conservation. Um, there are folks in Michigan trying to figure out a way to um, give discounts to farmers that do good conservation on their public drain taxes. Um, there's people thinking about how do you integrate conservation into farmland mortgages or um, operating loans. And I think, you know, when you're speaking about private lands conservation and you're thinking about farm by farm and ranch by ranch, it's, it seems almost impossible. Uh, so if you can work through these institutions that uh, farmers and ranchers are um, used to working with, uh, but operate at a scale that, um, you know, is the type of thing that's attractive to us, then, you know, those sorts of approaches are really appealing to me when you try to think about, um, you know, changing the paradigm um, in, in a wholesale fashion. Yeah, I don't want to go too visionary here, but if you want to think about it, um, we're trying to rebuild the commons. And the tragedy of the commons occurs because we forget that we are interrelated with each other and with the land, and we don't we stop making decisions at that level. So, um, like Bali has an amazing ability to coordinate up and down a watershed in terms of the water that's going to be distributed through that, and this is culturally embedded. And all those systems we ripped out over the last two hundred years, and now we're trying to reconfigure them. So I consider each of these landscape management projects as a way to begin rebuilding the commons, essentially. And we're going to make some mistakes. 
Uh, we're going to discover some things we didn't even know were possible. And that's going to be true on the finance side as well. Blended finance is a different way than we're used to doing it, including ecological and social criteria in your definition of returns. Different way of doing it. I didn't think we'd see that day. And maybe that's just a stepping stone to a completely different understanding of what finance is all about and how it should be managed. So I think you're right to point to that. Well, th we're talking about transitional times here. We got to think outside the box. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn over to Christoph uh, to say uh, yet a few questions. We can uh, use a, few, right a few questions or comments or maybe provocative uh, food for thought. Uh, for, for, for the restoration, landscape restoration mechanism team in FAO, and probably for the partners, we are working in areas where there is a strong need for restoration. So we have degraded lands in very poor countries and landscapes that are far from being ready for investment and attracting the pension funds. I can give you an example, a few examples. We are working in Central African Republic, Southwest, in South Kivu, where there is a private sector that is here, mining sector or timber, uh, but where, where we have a, a very, a governance that is relatively weak, or very weak in some case, uh, with decentralized entities and landscape stakeholders and smallholders that are working only with less than one hectare. Uh, so the transaction cost for having a deal at landscape level is higher than in a Chesapeake Bay or uh, where you have probably organization of farmers, strong stakeholders in front of you. And uh, I don't know, but maybe uh, 40 or 50 percent of the urgent need in terms of, of restoration are, are such areas, drylands, Sahel region, uh, Congo Basin regions in Africa. and. Uh, for those areas, we still need also to think about policy instruments, policy improvements, intersectoral coordination that is not existing. Before expecting to attract private sector, uh, the con we need to create the condition for having this risk a bit more acceptable. Even for the impact funds, th th there is a Moringa and Altelia, you are you have only a few deals in, 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 in those countries. You are working more in area where with less risk. So what kind of support on financing issue, what kind of finance we need to continue to bring, even if it's domestic of public finance, we need to, to continue to, to, to work also on, on, on those instruments uh, for, for, for such areas. And, uh, I would be happy to have your comments on, in terms of risk, uh, in terms of how you manage the risk, maybe, and even in the impact funds such as Altelia, what is the level of risk that is, an, is not acceptable for you? What, what is the minimum uh, set of uh, condition or indicators uh, you, we need to have uh, uh, before expecting to uh, attract you in, in, in areas where uh, you are not coming if you have not a partner that can prepare the ground for, it, for you. Uh, maybe I'll let you speak first, Christia. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, um, certainly you mentioned partners. So we, we um, are looking for a credible partner who we think can, can be in it with us for the long haul and uh, is wanting to go on that journey. Because the fa fact of the matter is, none of our existing investments have been invested by us um, uh, as is or off the shelf. So we put significant effort into structuring each and every one of them. And in order to do that successfully, we needed to be confident that the partner or partners in some cases um, had the competency and uh, uh, the, the ethics and the governance to, to be able to, 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 to collaborate with us. And having a, a, a panoply of public and private investors, some of whom are very profile, like uh, high profile, like the, the European Investment Bank, et cetera, uh, meant that we needed to, to always 
strive for the highest possible metrics when, when looking at things like governance, et cetera. And in operating in cha challenging landscapes, that's even, you know, a bigger deal, right? Uh, it's, it's one reason why we fell short a little bit on having as many investments in uh, sub-Saharan Africa as we had aimed to do. We, we have some. Uh, we we would, would like to have more in, in, in future funds. You mentioned risk. Um, we have friends from USAID here in the room, and uh, I have to take my hat, if I were wearing it, I'll take my glasses off to, to USAID, because in the very beginning, uh, J.P. Gibbons over there sat down with us and um, helped us structure, uh, 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 modify, if you will, an existing instrument that they used within USAID called the uh, DCA, or Development Credit Authority, to help apply uh, some sort of portfolio level risk management uh, for Althelia, which was very instrumental in creating the right mood and the right signal to, um, to some of the private investors who came in after the fact. Now, back in those days, JP, I thought that this would be the uh, sort of the clarion call to numerous sovereign governments uh, in Europe and elsewhere to sort of pile in and say, okay, right, the, the, you know, we've broken the seal on de-risking, we're going to do lots more, and innovation starts here. Um, we did another DCA with you for our Oceans Fund, and, and the, the, the sad fact is we have not seen a lot of um, um, DFIs lining up to replicate the good work that USAID has done. And I think that's, if there's a challenge coming out of my comments, I mean, it's, it's we, we need to create these incentives. We can do them by working with consumers who are looking for um, traceability and sustainability, and that's what our sister company, Ecosphere Plus, is doing a great job on, on the PES, the Payment for Ecosystem Services and the Carbon, um, and, and indeed the certified commodities. But um, we need um, the, the pull from policymakers, which, you know, with the shining example of, uh, of USAID, um, we haven't necessarily had as much as we, we like. And that leaves your question about risk only partially answered right now. It means that we have to find the right type of investor who, who is, who's, who's got an allocation for that, and that means it could be an insurance company who's got, you know, half percent or one percent of their portfolio into high-risk impact investments, but if we're trying to march to scale and big landscapes that sort of occupy whole provinces within countries, then we've got to go beyond just the impact investment um, allocation that some of the big guys have. We've got to break into the mainstream stuff that right now is going into unsustainable timber and unsustainable monoculture agriculture that's destroying pollinators, et cetera, et cetera. So again, a partial answer, but um, still lots more to talk about. Anybody in the group have any other experiences with mobilizing finance in those, uh, in those um, sort of more difficult areas that they would like to share? Someone have their hands up over here? Yes. Yes. Uh, just a moment. Let me let you get the mic. And your name and organization first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ruth Stiefer Sotomayor. I'm from the World Bank, and we finance <laughs> projects in very difficult areas. Absolutely. This is a very challenging topic. And unfortunately, uh, many countries don't want to invest. I mean, governments have other priorities. Housing, water schools and landscape and forest, forest lands have been lost, mainly for many agriculture, uh, monocultures and commodities. So I think that the partnership with the private sector is absolutely needed. And in fact, I came here to hear and to understand uh, how more atelias and more companies interested in investing in restoration can be supported. I mean, what kind of policies, what is needed to make this more a common path in many countries that are losing their natural capital? And that the, really the financial instruments that, at least from the multilaterals, uh, sometimes is not requested for things like this, you know? So I think that there is a challenge for all of us to find uh, what can be triggered to promote better sustainable uh, landscape, but mainly to find investors interested in this. Of course, the, cheaper, the cheapest way would be that countries could conserve uh, forest land and to make more sustainable landscape, but the reality is not. The reality is that the ecosystem and the forests are being lost, and sustainable forests, uh, sustainable landscape are not that common in many countries. Uh, so I'm interested to, to, to know uh, what kind of instruments, uh, financial instruments, and what can make an investor 
go forward to the common profitable scheme. Thank you. Okay, so I've want got to to, I'm that? sorry, I have to take that. I'm sorry, being a, <laughs> well, uh, uh, paid. Yes, of well course. And, and I say this with the greatest respect. Thank you for standing up and making your intervention. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm going to be as, um, as, as moderate as I can here. But we have been seeking to work with the World Bank. We meaning not just Althelia, but the private sector and others like Althelia. Uh, and, and many friendly NGOs who understand the importance of achieving scale and, generate, and, and helping public funds achieve leverage for um, more than 10 years. There are existing facilities out there like the FCPF and the, bio, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility and the Biocarbon Fund, uh, to name just a couple. And to my knowledge, the FCPF has one private investor. It's British Petroleum, BP. Uh, the Biocarbon Fund, despite numerous efforts by the likes of, of Global Canopy and others to sort of try to d design working with the World Bank some sort of incentive carrot-based system has yet to do a deal that I'm aware of with the private sector. And you know, if, if, I, if I suffered from um, uh, insecurity, I would think it was us. It was Althea. We, we didn't wear the right <laughs> cologne or something. But in fact, I know it's not because others who have sought to go down that road have also struggled. So if the World Bank really wants to talk to the private sector about what incentives are needed, we, we've, we've been writing it down. We've been si saying it till we're blue in the face. Um, other sectors like renewable energy have, have, have worked really well with feed-in tariffs and other incentive-based um, um, uh, mechanisms. We don't need new science. It's, the science is on the shelf. We need, we need to sit down and apply the tools that we already have in our tool chest in the land use sector, just like we're using them in other mitigation and indeed adaptation spaces. And we can do that tonight. I mean, we can sit down and we can structure a deal uh, with, with between the private sector company, you know, Acme Forest Investments, and you know, whichever you know, public entity is ready to go. Why we're having the reception afterwards. You want to sit down and work out a deal. Does anybody else on the panel want to respond to that question? If not, I have lots of other hands that were going up. Way in the back there, yes. More equitable. <laughs> I can see we won't get to everybody. Name and organization. My name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a private sector and capital markets advisor. My company is Heuristic Management. My question is about the 11 uh, projects for NL field um, funds I, that you reference. Uh, you didn't talk at all about performance. Can you talk with us about uh, the range of internal rates of return? And also a corollary question, which is, uh, do you have experience in, or can you provide some um, insight into what happens if you don't hit your milestones? Thanks. If you don't get what? Hit your milestones. Hit the milestones. Go ahead. Um, we're a closed-end uh, fund, uh, uh, CIF, CCAV. Um, we are making distributions to investors, but um, I'm not in a position right now to give, you know, in, in this forum to, to, to give hardcore numbers. Um, we're still, we're about halfway through the, the life cycle of the fund. Uh, it's gone pretty well. I can give you some, I mean, you might not be interested in them since you're from the financial sector, but I can give you just a couple of headline um, uh, indicators, which I would say are um, relatively um, um, correlated with how we're doing across the board in terms of the project. So we've... Um, um, we've created about 1,500 jobs, new jobs. Uh, we've got about 2.12 uh, million hectares under management. That exceeds what we had uh, anticipated uh, to put under conservation. Um, in terms of sustainable enterprises, and this kind of goes to where you're talking about, um, we've either created or supported 52 across the portfolio. So those are um, either uh, relatively small subsistence-based business businesses or indeed cash-generating businesses that are being supported. Um, I'm not going to sit, uh, sit there and tell you that it's easy. Um, in many cases, we've had to set up new uh, uh, commercial counterparties or cooperatives who, who can effectively fulfill that role of, of managing the, the, the financial performance on the ground. So it has been challenging, but it's moving, it's going pretty well. Um, I would say that I tend to avoid calling them projects because if I call them projects, I'll never get a date with the World Bank. As I'll tell you, they don't do projects. Um, but I think the private sector operates in a world where we call everything a project. If we're building a road, it's a project. If we're getting a new IT system, it's a project. So um, we have to get past that nomenclature divide. So I tend to call them investments. <laughs> but in any event, um, yeah, I'm sorry if that's not as uh, in-depth uh, an answer as you were looking for. But we are um, we had targeted something um, that was 
market-based commercial, and by that I kind of think of something, you know, in the five to ten percent range. And I think by the time Althea is finished, we'll we'll be in the range we want it to be. Can you clarify five to ten percent? What you mean is it annually? Is it over the life of the project? Just clarify what you mean. By <coughs> life of the investment. Percent. Life of the investment. Yeah. yeah. Over the life of the investment. Yeah. 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 If if you wouldn't mind. Uh, Thank you. That was wonderful. But uh, there, there's the, the corollary to that is, what do you do if you don't hit your milestones? How do you deal with your investors if if they're disappointed? <laughs> well, <laughs> depends on who the investor yeah, is. Okay. Um, um, so um, USAID helped us a lot with that because on day one we had the DCA, so we have a, um, a portfolio level guarantee. If uh, if think if it was complete and utter catastrophe, we we can we have some downside visibility. We don't anticipate having to use the guarantee, so we're pretty happy about that, but not as happy as JP. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, I think you know we have um, about fourteen investors. They understood from the very beginning what they were signing up to, and that they were very much operating in a new space. Um, we have sought to um, deal with risk management also in the way investments are structured. That means sometimes coming in uh, certainly with diversified returns, so we'll have productive activities that are sitting next to some new markets like carbon or payment for ecosystem services, but equally having partners on the ground who uh, are providers of public finance that can meet some of the early stage bills that would be very awkward for, for um, an investor. Um, nevertheless, the final answer to that is that um, the investors are equ uh, equity investors and they're taking, they're taking the risk. Um, we do operate on a debt-based model, um, and so that um, helps a little bit. But it is, um, there, there is, there's, you know, there's a reason why um, Althelia is not a $5 billion hedge fund, um, because there's, you know, we're still in the early stages, we're in the infancy, infancy stages of this. And, and, and the truth is, um, it still needs um, a plethora or a panoply, a variety of risk management tools, one of which is um, policy support. And that's why I was um, keen to have a conversation with people like the World Bank. Great. I'm just going to actually let Christoph mm -hmm. make a brief comment, and then we're going to have to, I'm going to ask each of you to, one minute, give us any last final messages, comments, things you want to say. No, more quote. Uh, then maybe it's not a comment, it's a, also a question for the panelists. Uh, from my perspective, we need to have long-term investment and capital in, in the landscape issues. Uh, and a lot of capital is short-term oriented and uh, with, uh, you know. Um, how how you, you see this issue? What is a good period for and, and, long, and the, the term of the capital we need, is it 60 years, 20 years? For Altelia, I assume that you have a, a, a vision in, the, in terms of uh, long-term investment or, or short-term. Can you give us your vision on, on, on the capital that is needed? Because short-term capital maybe is not good for, for landscape and agriculture investment. Agreed with you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to let you, if anybody can very briefly respond to that, and then we'll go, maybe you can incorporate that into your last uh, last <coughs> comments. Um, anybody want to particularly comment on the... Uh, well, I, I, Althelia itself is an 8 to 10 year uh, closed-in fund. We, um, again, set it up in 2011. Uh, in, in re if I could go back in time, I think uh, it would have a longer tenor to it. Um, and I can back that up with the fact that the funds that we're working on now, for instance, the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund, which will launch... Um, it's a part, it, well, Morova has purchased a stake in Althelia. Althelia will be managing the LDN fund later this year. That's a 15-year fund. And we think that's a nice length of time because, um, as you said, it's not necessarily appropriate to rush some of these um, transformative outcomes um, because you really put them in jeopardy. So you have to get coach investors to get to that sort of appetite level. Anything you want to say about that, Rob? I'd just say uh, maybe there's an example from the petroleum divestment campaigns and forcing institutional investors to think about, okay, what if they can't access those reserves because of changes in policy over the long run? So it's not just quarterly earnings of those companies, but it's the long-run strategy and the depletion of natural capital that's being put on the table. This may show up in more and more non-renewable resources uh, as the institutional investor is forced to think about the strategic issue. Um, that's all I'd, I'd say on that point. Okay. Well, let me just ask you, um, each of you, any last uh, message? Do many of these people are going into the Global Landscapes Forum. What should they be doing, talking about? What should they be going home and doing? What should they be asking themselves about? 
Kerr, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, conservation finance uh, has a very broad definition, and that's, you know, finding financial resources for uh, conservation, in our case, private lands conservation. We don't feel like there's any silver bullet here. Um, you know, that's why we're working on all sorts of different things, environmental markets, payments for ecosystem services. We have supply chain work trying to figure out how to get consumers and corporations to pay for, uh, you know, sustainable uh, farming practices, um, in addition to conservation finance work and institutional finance uh, work. And so, you know, I think this is a really exciting time, but uh, as Rob said, it's, it's hard to really run until you walk. And I think we are just really at the very beginning stages of building up the cadre of expertise of people and firms and um, understanding uh, and being able to measure the impact um, that all these, uh, you know, uh, 